a few minutes later, I'm pretty far along propagating my segmentation boundary throughout the entire clip. I just want to show you a couple issues I ran into so you know how to deal with them when you come across them. Now, as I start to move later in time, I have the issue where his head went out of frame. And as his head comes back into frame, Rotobrush has a hard time figuring out what to do with this boundary. For example, if I step forward one frame, page down or press two, you'll see these little areas pop up that are a gap between his white hair and the smoky background. I can hold down Option or Alt, exclude that, same for this other side, then go to the next frame, and I've got the same problem again. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit, Option or Alt, exclude that, go down another frame, and I've got a little bit more again. I can keep doing that, or I can say, you know, really what I have here is a problem with his head re-entering the frame. What if we start another base frame later in time where he's already fully in frame and work backwards from there? Well, here's how I go about it. Move back a little bit later in time to where he's kind of maxed out, right around there. These gray arrows are the roto brush span. How many frames roto brush is trying to predict my most recent brush strokes to come up with the math on subsequent frames? it automatically goes 20 frames out from your last brush stroke. You can trim this area. If I put my cursor here, I get double arrows and I drag back and say, you know what? Don't extend the span any further than that. I'll center up my image again. And you see the previous frame, I've got a segmentation boundary. The next frame, the boundary is around the entire frame. I am beyond my span. Rotor brush no longer has information that it's willing to use to predict. So instead, I'm gonna to go to the very end of this clip where he's back into frame the most, maybe right around there. And I'm gonna start a new base frame. You can have more than one base frame in a project. And it's good to start from these oh, representative or key frames to propagate out from. I'm gonna hold down Command or Control, get a wider brush again, and do this process over that you saw earlier. There's part of my stroke. Do the other part of his body here. Go to a smaller brush size, do some cleaning up, like there, 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 a little bit through the collar. Speaking of collar, we need to pick that up. Good. A little bit on his jacket there, and there. I'm going to just rush through this rather than make you sit through a bunch of tedium. Now that I've made a new base frame, signified by this gold bar, You'll see again, I have arrows going before and after in time. And it's the same deal all over again. Step backwards. Rotor brush will predict from that base frame back in time. Now you see I have less issue with the head because as his head exits the frame, it's much easier for rotor brush to predict what's going on than having unseen material enter the frame. That's the reason why I made a base frame later in time when his head was fully visible just to make it easier in Rotor Brush to predict what's going on. Okay, now I've got these two spans joined up. And let's go down to the end. And here's another thing about Rotor Brush. This green bar is just like your green cache bar in the timeline panel. If you jump several frames ahead, not only does Rotor Brush need to calculate that new frame, it needs to calculate all of the intermediate frames. So say I just pressed end to jump to the last frame, you'll see this message that Rotor Brush is propagating predicting frame by frame where the match should be until it ends up in my last frame. And there we are. We now have a segmentation boundary that lasts for the entire duration of this clip. And it did take less time than hand masking or hand painting. As I intimated earlier, there's a couple ways of looking at this. I can turn off the boundary and just see the background, either the transparency grid or the background color of the comp. If you're more of a Photoshop type of person where you're used to having a red alpha overlay, you can look at it that way and even change the color of the overlay and change the opacity so you can look at the background versus your cutout. Or you can just go ahead and look at a black and white mat. And again, this black and white mat at this stage in the process does look a little rough. Part of it is I'm looking at an intermediate magnification. I'll go to 100%, just get a clean edge here. But also at this point, I haven't refined my mat. This is a basic one pixel tolerance outline around this guy. In the next movie, I'm gonna show you how to refine this mat to create a much cleaner anti-aliased edge that even takes motion blur into account.